Welcome to the Causes or Cures podcast, your gateway to understanding health and groundbreaking medical research in a fun and easy to understand way. With Dr. Eeks as your host, join us as we sit down with the world's leading doctors and scientists to unravel the mysteries of health. From practical tips on well-being to the latest breakthroughs in medical research, we cover it all. Don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's ignite our curiosity and together dive into today's episode. Hello, hello there, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Causes or Cures. I'm Dr. Eeks, your host, and how is everyone doing today? Hopefully okay. If not, that's okay too. Take a time out and tune into this podcast. So, did you ever wonder what causes obesity? Oh, oh, what's that? I can hear it now. Eating too much and not getting enough exercise. Okay, that's the quick go-to answer. But, as it turns out, and after smart people have done a lot of research in this area in recent years, it's actually more complicated than that. Don't get me wrong, eating healthy and exercising absolutely helps anyone and everyone get healthier. I am insane about my exercise routine, but I'm just saying that there's more to the story and it's more complex than many people give it credit for. My guest today is the Mayo Clinic's Dr. Andres Acosta, who is going to tell us about the four different phenotypes of obesity, or essentially four different causes for people becoming obese and how he figured them out. You're going to hear the word phenotype a lot in this podcast, and an easy way to think about it is it's the set of visible traits or characteristics of a person such as someone's appearance, behaviors, and physical features, which result from the interaction of his or her genes with the environment, okay? And he'll also talk about how knowing someone's obesity phenotype can guide treatment, meaning what will work for that person versus what won't. Because today, not everything that gets prescribed to someone will actually work for that individual. This is both timely and fascinating, So let's connect to Dr. Acosta and learn more about this. Give me a few seconds here, guys. All right, everyone, we are connecting with Dr. Andres Acosta, and we're going to talk about obesity. Um, But first, thank you so much, Dr. Acosta, for joining us. And do you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself and what you do? Super. Uh, thank you, Ari. I'm delighted to be here, and um, it's quite a pleasure to uh, have time to chat with you. So I'm a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the Mayo Clinic. I'm an associate professor of medicine, and um, you know I, I focus my whole career in trying to understand and hopefully one day cure obesity. And for that, I'm uh, NIH-funded, industry-funded, and I do a lot of foundations work with the whole purpose of trying to understand obesity finding who would be the right person to respond to different therapies. And that way we can have a targeted approach for obesity. All right. And as, as my listeners know, because there's been other episodes I've done on obesity, everyone knows this is a big problem today, um, particularly in the U S and other developed countries, but it just keeps getting worse. It seems the percentages. Yeah, it does. Uh, We continue to see the numbers uh, climb uh, with a projected prevalence of obesity, but to be 50% in adults uh, in the United States, which is so worrisome, so concerning uh, to have this public epidemic um, and healthcare crisis, but also alarming around the world. People say, oh, when I go abroad, I don't see obesity. Well, uh, a billion people, so a billion people in the world are suffering from obesity. So it's not just in the United States. It is something affecting all of us. And um, that's why it's such an important topic. Yes, absolutely. So I read from, from when I was reading some of your papers uh, in preparation for this podcast, but one of your goals uh, is to develop a personalized approach to obesity management. But before we talk about that, can you describe what is the heterogeneity of obesity or this notion that not everyone will develop obesity because of the same thing or in the same way. Yeah. So I think that's the root cause uh, of when we talk about obesity, because everybody says, so why do we have obesity? Why do we struggle with obesity? 
And at the same time, if we put on the other side of the equation, why do people try to lose weight? And some people lose weight very easy with some interventions, and some people lose weight with other interventions. So that's a question that we've been asking now for almost 15 years um, when I started doing my postdoc here at the Mayo Clinic. And then it's fascinating to see that, you know, people gain weight because of different reasons. And you can just see, you can start talking with people with obesity and they will tell you, yep, yeah, I was the kid who struggled with weight and I have an obesity my whole life. And you're like, okay. Some other people say, you know, I was completely fine until my mid-30s, I got injured when I was exercising, I stopped exercising, or my work demand, or life, or whatnot, the kids, and so on. I stopped my activity, continue eating as I was eating, and then suddenly start gaining weight. Some other people will say, particularly women, it's easy to see, I was a healthy weight through my life, and then menopause hit, and I gained weight during or after menopause, right? And we can see when people gain weight. But then even within those different examples of when people gain weight, we can ask, why are these people gaining weight, right? So let's take the example of two different kids. Both of them struggle with obesity. And when they become teenagers, both have the definition of obesity, right? And we look at them, and one probably had obesity his whole life. I'm talking about teenagers, so maybe for 10 years or 15 years. And they have this problem with hyperphagia. They have a genetic condition that tells them to eat more and eat all the time. They don't feel full. While the other kid maybe, unfortunately, experience some sort of event in their lives or have depression or something else that is driving them to cope life with their calories. At the same time, we can go through different examples of people who have gained weight because of different reasons. And it's essential that we understand why, why we have obesity why me as an individual, I struggle with obesity, in order to then to pair that understanding with a treatment that will be more efficient for them. So we talk a lot about things that may be driving obesity. We talk about this genetic predisposition. We talk about the obesogenic environment. We talk about medications that are driving obesity. We talk about our own bodies, but we rarely go and say, why on my, on me, why do I have obesity? And I think that's key. That is key because in all, any other disease, we like to know why people have, have that disease. We need to know why you develop that in, in disease and why you, you treat it that way, right? So my mom went through breast cancer recently, and it was fascinating because we actually went down, or the doctors went down, to all this way, this pathway to knowing what was the genetic predisposition that she had breast cancer. And then that was how they we understood why she had this genetic mutation that I was carrying on her family for breast cancer. And then she got a treatment that was tailored to her own cancer, to her own disease. So that gave my mother a peace of mind to understand why she developed cancer. Not that she did anything wrong. She was just born with this genetic mutation. But then the treatment was paired with that. In obesity, we have this huge stigma. We don't know why people People say, why do I struggle with weight? I'm trying to do everything great. I'm trying to eat healthy. I'm trying to do all these great things. And I still struggle with obesity. So the second we know why, we will remove the stigma because we start calling this obesity as a disease and we understand why we have developed that disease. And then we'll be able to pair it with a treatment. So that is my vision. And that's hope we can achieve and change the conversation in obesity and the way that we manage it. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm sure our listeners can relate to whether it's themselves or someone they know, a friend saying, I've tried everything. I don't know what's going on. I can't lose this weight, you know? And it, they kind of chalk it up to this mystery. They do the whole trial and error thing. And it's just super frustrating for a lot of folks. And they're trying. It's not like they're not trying. They're trying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I remember a study a couple of years back that's saying that uh, on average, um, uh, Americans with obesity are trying four to five diet attempts per year. So it's not that we're trying. And I'm not talking about people who don't have discipline because many people say when they have obesity and you know you read the, in the post or in the chats and say, oh, it's because they don't have discipline. No, the contrary. These people, like most of us, you know, we're showing up to work. We are paying our bills. We're, we're very successful at work with our kids, with everything else we do in life, but obesity. So it's not about discipline. It's something else going on and, and happy to dive into those things. 
All right, before we get into the different phenotypes for obesity that you all came up with, I wanted to ask, you know, everyone's talking about the weight loss medications, the obesity medications. These are blockbuster medications for those who have access to them and can afford them. What is the expected weight loss response to anti-obesity medication in general? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we have uh, six FDA approved medications for obesity. For, uh, and when we define obesity is this Medicaid, the FDA approves them for weight loss. The first medications that we currently have approved were approved in the uh, late 90s with Orlistat. Then we have a uh, few medications approved in the 2012, 2014 with Fentermin, Topiramate, Extended Release, Upopiro Naltrexone, Sustained Release, and then um, Liraglutide in the three milligram dose. And then most recently, since 2021, we have um, uh, semaglutide uh, approved for the 2.4 milligram dose. And uh, now more recently, as last year, uh, tercepatide with the uh, 5, 10, and 15 milligram dose. So when we talk about average, for example, talk about the last two on semaglutide, the average, depending on the studies, there's multiple studies that have done randomized trials. The weight loss is somewhere between 14 to 16% total body weight loss on average in 64 weeks. For tercepatide, the weight loss, again, depending on the study, ranges from 20 to 22% of total body weight loss in 72 weeks, so a year and a half of treatment. But I think it's important, and that's why you know, we have been working on this, to talk about average versus reality. So in the study, of course, studies that include hundreds of patients, some of them thousands of patients, include an average. And when we look at that average, we see that there are patients who are doing incredibly well, and some patients who are losing very little weight. So because of that, the FDA asked uh, pharmaceutical companies to report the percentage of patients who lose 5, 10%, 15%, 20%, and now we're even seeing some studies showing 25%. So for example, in the case of semaglutide, 30% of patients to 40% of patients will not lose more than 10%. So let's think about what 10% means. It means a patient who is 300 pounds only losing less than 30 pounds, okay, in these 64 weeks. With tercepatide, which is, of course, a better medication on weight loss outcomes, only about 10 to 15% will not lose 10%, but about 30 to 40% will not lose more than uh, 15%. So with these numbers and with the cost of these medications, I always wonder and ask myself saying, who are this third of these patients who are not going to respond to these medications? And if there's something that we can do to actually be more cost effective, because the downside of these great medications that on average gives you great weight loss is that if they don't work for you as an individual, you still have to pay and you don't know. Right, right. And they are certainly not cheap. Right. Um, can you just tell our listeners the generic names of those drugs, just in case folks may have heard them as, you know, Ozempic or Wago, yeah. Uh, so for semaglutide, uh, it comes in two forms. Ozempic is for type 2 diabetes, and Wagobi is for uh, obesity. And then for tercepatide, uh, we have uh, um, Monjaro for type 2 diabetes and Cepbound uh, for uh, obesity. All right. So if folks knew knew them by those names, they can go rewind and listen to what you yeah. just said and <laughs> and get the full picture there. Yeah, so, absolutely. And that is actually a high number of people who aren't responding. Great. But it's not surprising. When we start working on trying to define who are the best responders, we actually saw similar data with bariatric surgery. So if you think about bariatric surgery, which is a lot more aggressive intervention for obesity that requires, you know, uh, anatomy changing with you know surgical uh, in, um, uh, procedures, we also saw patients who will not respond with bariatric surgery, and a lot of patients will regain weight after surgery. So for that reason, we are not surprised that medications will also have non-responders. And I think that's the key for us to try to understand who are those who are going to do great with these meds, and who are those who are not going to do great with these meds. And the prescribing practice now, I guess people don't really know. Is it basically educated guess, trial, and error? If some, yeah, yeah, if someone's not responding, try to switch the meds or something like that. Correct. The current gold standard is is a little bit of a shared decision making in which you discuss with the patient uh, first if they want to, you know, you know, let me put it that way. 
in a comprehensive weight management program that you offer everything. You will discuss with your patient first what kind of intervention they're looking for and what kind of outcomes they're expecting. And you discuss lifestyle interventions, lifestyle interventions plus meds, endoscopic procedures, or surgical procedures. And then based on the expectations of the patients of what you decide, you choose an intervention. And that decision of how you choose uh, right now is based on patients' comorbidities and basically patients' preferences. But there's really no objective guidance like we have in other diseases on how to guide therapy and how to select the right intervention for the right patient. And the other thing too is when someone stops the medication for whatever reason, there's a good chance the weight's going to come back on. Great. That we have seen through um, in all the, the medications uh, and all the studies for medications since the early ones that were approved in 2012 to the new ones. If you lose weight with a medication and you stop um, you know, cold turkey or abruptly, uh, the weight will c come back immediately. Not immediately, but you start regaining weight. And by the end of the year, you'll have, you were where you started. All right. So let's talk about the four phenotypes of obesity. Can you tell us a little bit about those and the types of tests and measures you did to establish these? Great. So in trying to understand why we're all different and what's the unique among each of these patients. What we decided to do starting back in 2012 was to start measuring all these different variables or uh, tests that were available for obesity that people have been doing it for a couple of decades. And we said, well, what we're going to do is the only thing different we're going to do is we're just going to measure absolutely everything on that patient. Instead of me just focusing on one of those little things and trying to understand obesity from that little angle, we said we're going to measure everything on everyone. So what do we measure? Because this is complicated. We measure all the concept, all the components of energy balance and behavioral traits. So a patients come early in the morning after an overnight fasting. We start by measuring their indirect calorimetry. So we put someone in a big hood that they breathe, like I tell them they're in an, uh, with a big astronaut helmet. And then we ask them to breathe within that helmet for about 30 minutes in order to know how is their metabolism, their basic metabolic rate, or also called their resting energy expenditure. So that's the first thing we do in the morning. Then we ask you to lay down in a, a DEXA scan, in which is a, we take an X-ray of your body to know your body composition, how much fat you have, where is your fat, how much muscle you have, how much a bone tissue you have. And then we start collecting samples. Samples we collect and start collecting at fasting, and then we collect every 30 minutes or so for the next four hours. Um, then we provide you breakfast, and that breakfast has some radio label materials that we can take pictures of how the food goes through your stomach and your small bowel, and we'll take pictures for the next four hours. While we're taking these pictures and while we feed you your breakfast of 320 calories breakfast, we start telling you how Tell us how full do you feel. So we do these visual analog scales that goes from a range from zero to 100. And you tell us where do you feel hungry, fullness, desire to eat, and satisfaction. And we do all this for four hours, for the next four hours. And towards the second part of the morning, we start doing some behavioral questionnaires. Do you have anxiety? Do you have a stress? Do you have an emotional eater? How do you see your body composition? How do you see your body's attitudes? Your attitude towards your weight? Are you physically active? And so on and so on. And then when people start feeling hungry around noon or one, when they have reached the level of hunger, we feed them all you can eat, uh, lasagna, pudding, or milk. And we do what is called a libidum meal test. And we ask them to eat as much as they want until they reach five over five fullness. Or I like to explain to the patients, Thanksgiving night fullness. So when you like we'll have one more bite of food and you're going to be sick. And then we follow for another two hours asking you how full do you feel and when hunger starts coming back. So this whole process, complicated, takes 10 hours. And at the same time, we're taking a lot of samples. Samples to know your glucose, samples to know your insulin, samples to know hormones like your GLP-1, blood, blood samples to know metabolites and hormones and amino acids, and then stool samples to know your microbiome and urine samples and all these things. So we basically want to know absolutely everything about you and this whole Thing takes about 10 hours. And what we realized when we were done the first 500 patients is that, boy, we were all different. And we'll see people who eat a lot and don't feel hungry and people who eat a lot and feel very hungry and all this variety of things. 
So in this world, not only of GOP ones, but also of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we asked the you know the computer saying, how would you classify obesity if you have all this data? Which we couldn't make sense. There was all sort of patterns, right? And then the, our initial classification came up with 11 types of obesity. And then when we took that outside of the black box of the machine learning, we said, well, maybe this, there's really four groups, maybe five. We decided to group them in four key groups that were close to each other. And that's how we uh, came up with these four types of phenotypes of obesity. So you have the hungry brain, the emotional hunger, hungry gut, and slow burn. Those Correct. are okay. Okay. Well, I like the names because they're easy to remember. Yes, <laughs> you know that's exactly why we were talking about. We need. We said we needed to put new names because hungry brain and hungry gut are um, academically or scientifically are abnormal satiation and abnormal prosplandal satiety. And unfortunately, in the academic literature, the term satiation and satiety usually gets confused. And in many other languages, it's the same thing. There's no, I'm like I'm in Spanish speaking, so there's not a real translation for one or the other. So we said, you know, we need to walk away from these complicated terms if we want to explain it to my patients. So when I was telling to my patients, they were like, I was talking about their satiation and they were saying talking about their satiety. So it's very simple, the difference. Satiation, defined by a, a term uh, from uh, Professor John Blundell at the University of Leeds in the UK, is how many calories we consume until we feel full and then we stop. So we're eating. I'm going to keep eating until I feel full and then eventually I'll stop. If we measure those calories, that's your satiation. How many calories you consume to satiation? And then your prospandial satiety is for how long you continue to feel full. So it's more a, a feeling or a sensation of your fullness. And then some people will have a meal and then within an hour they feel hungry again. So they have very short satiety. But some people will have a meal and four or five hours later they say, I still feel full from my previous meal. So that's your satiety for how long you stay feeling full. So because of that difference, we say we need to have something that I can explain to my patients a little bit easier. And by doing a lot of mechanistic studies, we realized that people with abnormal satiation, they had a problem predominantly with areas of the brain in the hypothalamus in the brain. So we call it the hunger brain phenotype. And we know a lot about these areas of the brain. And then for patients with hungry gut, you know, predominantly it's because they're, the gut's not releasing these hormones to slow down your gastric emptying and to tell you to continue to feel full. Things like GLP-1, peptide YY, and many of these other hormones. So that's why we call it the hungry gut phenotype to try to separate these two terms. And then the ones we separate those, those two terms, you know, the emotional eater, uh, eating uh, behavior is has also been labeled by many others um, uh, in the field is uh, is known to the, to have the people who have emotional eating, and then the slow burn phenotype. We wanted to explain to patients that their metabolism is inefficient and they're not burning enough calories, so we came up with the term slow burn to try to explain to patients why they're metabolically inactive, and that's how we came up with these four obesity phenotypes. Okay, and a person can have more than one of those phenotypes, right? Correct. So 27% of patients with obesity will have two or more phenotypes. And what is interesting is that in a more recent publication, we, we, we demonstrated that people who have more than two or more phenotypes, actually they have prone to have higher body weight, higher body mass index, and higher comorbidities or prevalence of comorbidities. So more, unfortunately, is not good or having two or more. Right, right. And I guess that makes some logical sense. So once you, somebody gets their phenotype, your, your doctor, you tell a patient, you know, I think you're this phenotype, then what does that look like in terms of choosing the medication? Can you give an example if, I don't know, someone's an emotional eater or someone's a hungry gut, how does that change or, or would it potentially change your treatment protocol? Yeah. And I think that's the strength of what we are talking right now, that it's very patient centric and we really want to help patients. And that's why we're doing all these academic exercises. And at the same time, we have been publishing counters of papers. I'm happy to provide the references if you want to add them to your podcast. But we have multiple pa uh, review uh, papers, sorry, that we uh, study these in randomized placebo control trials, as well as real world studies. So bringing things to the clinic. So 
uh, then we have been able to come up with a working algorithm for each of the obesity phenotypes. So for example, someone with hungry gut, there is a hungry gut diet, which is basically pre-protein supplementation, 30 minutes to an hour before the main meals. Then we have the medications are the GOP ones, liraglutide, semaglutide. So liraglutide is axenda orbitosa, semaglutide is osempic or Ygobi, and tercepatide, uh, setbound or Munjar. So those are the best things. And then for endoscopic procedures, we have intragastric balloons and intragastric gels, as well as uh, for um, surgery, we have the ruined by gastric bypass. And we have studied all these things. And that's why I feel quite comfortable saying that we have evidence to support each of these comments that I just made uh, with the studies that have been published in peer review documents, showing that we think this is the best way to select the right patient, the patient with hungry gut for these interventions, such as GLP-1s. Now, what about a slow burn person? How how would you treat treat that person? Yeah, so slow burn is quite complicated because um, we we have shown data that an exercise routine with high intensity interval training, uh, plus resistance training, uh, and a diet with protein supplementation after each workout is the best option. In a twelve week study, patients lost eight um, percent of body weight but there's no medication, there's no device, and there's no surgery for them. So, of course, there are some medications on the pipeline, but right now, the best recommendation is um, exercise and protein supplementation. Protein supplementation. Yeah. Okay. Is that like a protein powder or something? You know, protein comes in so many different ways. And many people who like to exercise, like myself, we tend to consume some protein after our workouts. And that's what we basically told our patients. We told them, we want you to eat less so you lose weight but we want you to have some protein after your workout. Uh, And then we say, we need to build muscle mass. And that's what we recommend patients. Uh, In our study, we have different sorts of protein, you know, um, uh, meat-based proteins, uh, plant-based proteins, protein powders, protein bars, all sorts of proteins, whatever the protein it is, uh, we were not restricting to any of them in the study. I read that your company, which we're going to talk about, Phenomics, also includes or has diet plans and exercise plans for the specific phenotypes, which I really liked. I Mm -hmm. thought that was because a lot of people are complaining, even when they get these obesity medications from their doctors, that's it, right? They don't get any other kind of advice. So uh, I like that you guys did that. Um, Yeah, um, that was based, uh, sorry for interrupt. Uh, No, (laughs) go ahead. (laughs) No, so that was based on the study that we published last year uh, on our phenol diet trial. And in that trial, we have each of the diets for each of the four phenotypes with lifestyle and behavioral therapy. So we have paired each of the phenotypes with with a program, and we compared it to a standard Mediterranean diet, and we saw that patients significantly benefit uh, with this diet approach. And the emotional eaters, does that involve some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that? Absolutely. So people with emotional eating, they're coping with life with food. And that can be a good thing like a lot of positive things. I have a good day, I'm going to eat something. But also, unfortunately, I have a bad day, I'm going to eat something. So uh, for that reason, what we did is uh, we decided to build a 12-week program with our uh, behavioral psychologist, uh, Dr. Matthew Clark, in order we really tailored to that cognitive behavioral program. And it was fascinating to see because when this group came on board, all of them had emotional eating. So because all of them had emotional eating, the group was fascinated how they click with each other, how they were able to support each other and then continue to work together in the long term. So it was really an exciting way to see in that, you know, these patients, we don't need to tell them do crazy diets or do, you know, very hardcore exercise. They really responded to behavioral therapy. It's so interesting how different people respond to different emotions. You know, some people eat a lot, you know, ice cream, pizza, and then there's the people who don't eat anything they can't eat. Uh, <laughs> just... And that's that's what we're trying to figure out. And I think more people should try to work on this to see why yeah. we're so different. The mind-body connection, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so I read your paper, Selection of Anti-Obesity Medications Based on Phenotypes Enhances Weight Loss, uh, which was published in Obesity pretty recent in 2023. Can you talk about that trial and the outcomes when you treat 
folks who have obesity based on this phenotype versus you're not treating based on the phenotype? Yeah, so so this was a real world uh, intervention. And what we decided to do is, you know, there were, you know, the traditional patient that will come to see a physician and they will just be prescribed medications, basically based on a decision between the patient and the doctor. And then we we decided to have a different group of people who will actually go through these phenotyping tests, and then the medication will be paired based on their phenotype. Now, as I mentioned before, we've been publishing a lot in this space, and we have many papers that were, many of them were randomized controlled trials. So we decided we needed to do this real-world study in a little bit in a pragmatic way. We call it a pragmatic study. The, we only use FDA-approved medications, and all this testing that we were doing is also available at the Mayo Clinic for clinical use, not just research, but also for clinical. So we basically decided to pair 84 patients into this phenotype-guided approach and compared to a standard approach. Everyone got medications. And what we saw at one year is that patients who got medications based on a phenotype-guided intervention, they lost uh, close to 16% of total body weight loss compared to 9% on patients who got the same type of medications, but it was given in a shared decision-making or in a standard of care approach. So what we show in that paper is that in a real-world study, in a pragmatic study, you can actually improve the patient's outcomes just by pairing the right intervention to the right patient. And that was a, a fascinating observation to see. Of course, it requires some additional testing at baseline, but it, It improves the outcomes, but more important, and that's not on the paper, and that's very difficult to document, those patients really change their conversation and their attitude and acceptance about obesity. Because they knew, and of course that brings the bias into this manuscript, that they knew they had this underlying problem, a hungry gut, a hungry brain, an emotional eating, or a slow burn. And because of that, if one could ask, ask or say they're going to change their behavior and maybe take more of the medication, but I also understand why there's a medication for them because they, they have this underlying problem. So it really changes the conversation with the patients. And then they're not taking a medication just for weight loss, or I'm going to try that because my friend tried or because I saw an ad on TV, but really you start thinking, I'm going to take this medication because I had a test that was done on me. That test was abnormal. And now there is a medication to treat that abnormality that I have. And that treating that will help me with weight loss. So it's a fascinating change in conversation. And I think is that what, at least to me, excites more when I'm seeing patients in my clinic um, of how we have changed the conversation. It's not about weight anymore. It's about treating the underlying pathophysiological abnormality and then seeing that this sign called extra weight or uh, uh, adiposity starts dissolving or going away as we treat the underlying problem. I want to get into your company and how that practically works for someone who wants to know what their phenotype is. But I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, just because I work in public health and if you're on social media, there's obviously, as you know, lots of opinions about obesity and, you know, there's this, you know, obesity is a disease. There's some folks who will never accept that and they'll be like, oh no, it's just self-discipline and this and that. And oftentimes you see folks go back in time and they're like, well, during this era, nobody was had obesity in America. It's our food supply. It's our sedentary lifestyle. Um, If we could fix all that, we wouldn't have obesity. As a doctor working in this area, what are your thoughts when you hear that sort of thinking? So I think is as as is a, there's a there's a need for education in that space and i think it's important to explain to people what i think is happening and this now this comes this is my opinion but here's what i like to tell my patients or when i'm in a podium i get asked this question and i like to say go to a museum that you can see live paintings of people between their 1600 to 1800 right and if you're walking through a museum and you see a portrait of someone royalty, a king, a queen, or someone high up in society, they will be on the overweight side. If we calculate their BMI, some of them even might have obesity. Okay? Real portrait. Okay? 
if you walk through the same aisle and then you see paintings or portraits of people, common people, not rich people, more likely poor people, they are skinny. BMI is likely in the low 20s, even in the, in the teens, right? So, okay. So rich people back in the day had obesity, poor people don't. So what has happened in the world since in the last 50 years or 80 years since the Second World War? Now we live on abundance. Now it's a great thing as a civilization, people are not starving anymore. It's a great thing. The majority of us are not starving in the world, right? So we have more people having been having access to multiple meals a day than people don't having access to at least one meal a day. That's a huge advantage as a, as a civilization. So with that all comes to saying we come with a strong genetics to save calories. Now that we live in abundance, we're all gaining weight. As the rich people did, you know, two or three centuries ago. So now we're all living in abundance. We all can have multiple meals a day and we're gaining weight. So that's what we're seeing that the majority of us now have obesity. So we have this strong genetic predisposition. We live on abundance. And there's a few other factors that contribute on this. So first, a very strong genetics for weight gain, saving calories, more food in our plate, so quantity. Also, the quality of the food is might not be the best. And there's a lot of conversations about ultra-processed food and how that is affecting us. And I think that's data to follow very closely. And we're learning a lot about this. And I think it's going to tell us a lot more of ultra-processed food. And we need to keep doing those studies. We also know we're less physically active. We're more sedentary. We don't exercise that much. So all these other things in this genetic and this abundance have contributed for us to have obesity. But we cannot tell people who say, oh, no, this is just discipline. It's like, you cannot discipline your genetics and the abundance. So I prefer to live in a world that we have an excessive amount of food and try to figure the world of obesity than going back to the world that we were before in which food was scarce and we didn't have enough. Yeah. What we need to figure out now is why people are gaining weight and how to solve that. In this world of abundance, that hopefully we can continue, we can continue to share that excessive amount of resources and food to the rest of the world. Uh, I like that. And and you're so right. I, I When you go back and see those paintings and like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, like they're not skinny. They're not skinny kings, skinny women. They're big. Um, they're big. Yeah, they're big. Okay, let's get to your company, Phenomics. If I wanted to, let's say I had obesity, like I don't, but let's say I did and I was interested and in, like knowing what my phenotype was. How, how would that work? Yeah, so so when I was talking about the phenotypes and showing the data, everybody told me, you know, this will never work unless we have a simple test, a simple biomarker test that can tell us about obesity phenotypes. So in 2017, 2018, we started working on that. Um, we started looking for biomarkers and we came up with this strong genetic test that Eventually, we, uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, as well as myself, my my partner on this, Michael Camilleri, we decided to spin out into a company. And this company called Phenomic Sciences, which is a spin out of Mayo Clinic, it has now took that test, validated or advanced even way farther than what we did, validated, and then uh, now is commercializing this test called My Phenom. So what is My Phenom test? It's a test that we help contribute and, and build uh, with uh, their chief uh, data and technology science from Phenomic Sciences, Tim O'Connor. And what we did with Tim is we built a genetic risk score in which we look at all these different pathways that connects our gut with our brain. And basically, we understand that if you have a lot of abnormal genetic variants, you are consuming more calories before you feel full. So I like to explain that in a very simple way for everyone to understand is if you are in front of you and you have a very straight highway, it will be very easy for the signal to go through, right? Your car to go through, your signal to go through. So when I start eating, if I have a normal pathway, I'm going to feel full sooner. But if my pathway is very turns and there's holes and there's potholes and there's people on their way and whatnot, and there's a lot of traffic, the signal that is not going to go that fast and it's going to take me time to me to feel full. And that's why I can consume more calories before I feel full and stop. So that is what this genetic test is telling us, whether how intact is your pathway between your gut and your brain. 
And all that is measured with a genetic test. And that genetic test, by studying this pathway, tells me whether I have hungry brain or hungry gut. Um, <clears throat> so um, how does this work? You go to one of a physician that has um, that can order the test, or you come to uh, the Phenomic Sciences website, um, and uh, you uh, can either order the test with a doctor that is provided by Phenomics or by um, your own doctor. You order the test like you order any other test, a lipid panel, a CBC, a hemoglobin A1C. And then within 10 days to two weeks, you get the results of your genetic test, and it tells you whether you have hungry gut, hungry brain, emotional hunger, or a combination of them, or none. And then based on all the studies we have done, you uh, and your doctor can decide what treatment will be the best option for you uh, based on this uh, objective uh, observation that we have uh, based on phenotypes. Can you say if one phenotype or a combination of the phenotype is most common? Yeah, the most common one we see is um, is usually actually two, hungry brain with emotional hunger or hungry gut with emotional hunger. So emotional hunger, it's a big component. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's uh, one of the most prevalent phenotypes. Emotional hunger. Yeah, 32% okay. of patients um, suffer from emotional hunger. Okay, okay. And once they find this out, if I learned my phenotype from your website, do you can I then get help from your website or do I have to just take it to my doctor and work so with there, there's a lot of educational materials uh in the in the website in the portal we also have been publishing a lot and giving this kind of a, a podcast as well educational materials that people can go and find in the website um or with the results of the test uh, you get a, a good amount of uh, information about diets behavioral therapy um, and uh, lifestyle interventions that you should do. And we're, you know, the company is working very hard on, on trying to even increase that kind of information for patients to do. Because many people are saying, what is the hungry brain diet, for example, if I get that? Um, and what is the hungry gut diet? And that people want to know that. Uh, okay. But beyond that, it will be information from your doctor um, or your prescriber, uh, your provider, whether they want to take this to the next level on um, devices, um, medication devices or surgery. So one of the most concerning things I think about obesity is how it's impacting kids and younger people. Uh, you know, and you can think about them developing sort of like a domino effect, right? If they let the obesity go, you can get um, other chronic illnesses, potentially it puts you at a higher risk, makes it harder to fight off infectious diseases. I didn't look at uh, the age in some of your studies, admittedly, but I was just curious, do, would this work for you know children and adolescents as well as adults? Is that the plan eventually? I like to say that we all have a phenotype, uh, or particularly we all have a genotype, and then that can translate into a phenotype. Most of our studies, uh, or I would say all the published studies, have been on adults, 18 year olds and older. Of course, there's a huge need to study these genotypes and these phenotypes in kids. And we're trying to work towards that uh, with the super different studies and collaborators, uh, because I think it's essential, as you said, to try to figure out whether this can help uh, kids with obesity. All right, and for our listeners, I'll include a link to your company in case folks are interested, because I'm sure some will be and, and, yep. and want to check it out. <clears throat> Um, so I guess this is kind of like my final question here. It's more of a philosophical question, but when do you think, or do you think we will get ahead of obesity? When do you see that happening or how do you see that happening and what's, what's it going to take? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So we have great tools in our, in our toolbox. Um, with the new medications, I think we can do wonders. We have endoscopic procedures and surgery. I think what we need to do is uh, first uh, change the conversation into understanding why I struggle with obesity at an individual level. Because once I understand that, I can try to seek what will be the right therapy for me. So I think the why is a key Think that we need to change the intervention and then we can seek those tools that are available and every time we're going to have better and more tools but i also want to think it's also important that we really understand how we can manage these phenotypes or these underlying disease or pathophysiological disease of obesity 
with lifestyle behavioral changes that actually work for the long term. Because unfortunately, a lot of these lifestyle changes that we try to do on diets, they don't work for the long term. And that's why we struggle. So it's time that we start looking into precision nutrition as one of the strongest investments in our future. Because if I know what you or I need to eat, first, to prevent obesity, second, to treat obesity, and third, to avoid a relapse into obesity or a yo-yo effect is essential. Because the meds are going to be great and surgery is great to get us the weight off. But are we going to be on a medication for life? Well, as of right now, the answer is yes, because we have nothing else. But I hope that in the future, we actually can find a way to saying, well, if I know your phenotype, you need to lose weight with this medication and then stay off with this other medication that is safer and cheaper and long term. So why? A tailored approach, but also needs to be cause effective is essential that we manage obesity in a cost-effective manner because mm. 120 million people in the United States, there's a billion people worldwide. We cannot afford to do surgery on everyone. We cannot afford putting everyone into one of these medications. So we need to have something that is cost-effective. And in order to be cost-effective, the treatment needs to be somewhere around the two to $3,000 per patient. And then we'll see all the benefits of weight loss. But right now with the current cost of the new meds or even with surgery, that is a little bit prohibited. And it's essential that we walk into a cause-effective pattern. And that's why it's key that we can find who are the real people that needs these meds and who can benefit from a previous generation meds. And that's what we have uh, talked about. One of the previous medications, fentanyl to pyramid extended release, Qsemia, works great of people with hunger brain. So if they do great with a hungry brain and the medication is about $100 a month, that's great, right? We don't need the expensive med on those folks. And that's what I think is the future. So the future needs to be, let's change the conversation by understanding the why, let's find a tailored approach, and then let's make sure this is cost-effective. Cost-effective. Did you happen to watch, I don't know, do you watch South Park? I did, yes. <laughs> did you watch the obesity special? Yeah, they they uh, they um they went... They were right in many things. <laughs> they go, they go all in. I mean, it's South Park, yeah. but yeah, they, they. Def I thought though, you know, they did a good job differentiating what it's like to be rich with obesity and what it's like to be poor with obesity. And I thought that they did capture that, the essence of that, um, in terms of what's available to folks. Yeah. Um, anyways, I and also I just wanted to mention this because I think it is an issue: the percentage of folks who gain weight from medication that they're on, maybe it's uh, you know, a drug that they're taking for a particular mental illness or something like that. Is, is that a whole other ball game? Are those folks kind of, I mean, this phenotype stuff, is it really going to work for them? Probably not. Well, it might because it might. many of these okay. medications, um, many of these medications are making you gain weight by different reasons. Some of them make you feel hungry. Some of them don't make you feel full. Some of them slow down your metabolism. Some of them are triggering uh, an emotional component on you that you want to eat more. Some of them, we don't know what you gained. The key is, uh, and for all the, the providers who are listening, physicians and these and NPs, is make sure we treat patients as a whole and not just with your one disease that you care. And I say this as an example because I often see patients who come with you know, chronic pain from one of their joints because of obesity. And because we don't want to give them opioids, and you have covered a lot of the opioids epidemic, we give them medications that you know are long-acting you know pain or chronic pain modulators. And unfortunately, their side effect is weight gain. So the patient came with obesity and joint pains. We give them a medication for joint pain that actually going to make them gain more weight, more weight, more joint pain, and we go into this vicious cycle, right? So we need to think about what we're doing and treat patients as a whole, not give a medication that the side effect is going to make the underlying cause of their disease even worse. Uh, and I think that's the art of medicine that we need to pursue and treat the patient as a whole with the patient-centric approach. Uh, so many of these medications, they are good alternatives. And we have been writing a series in the journal Obesity Pillars in which we say weight-centric approach to different diseases diabetes, NASH or MASH, depression, and so on and so on. And I think that's key because 
we want to treat the underlying problem. And if we say that obesity is driving 280 diseases, well, let's treat obesity and those 280 diseases might improve. So uh, getting to the root cause, addressing the whole person. I know some people don't like that word root cause, but I do. I, I kind of do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dr. Acosta, thank you so much for your time today. This was really interesting and I, I look forward to sharing it. I think we covered... I, I covered pretty much everything I think I wanted to ask you and you have extra minutes to get to your meeting now for <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, all thanks right. so much. Um, and uh, yeah, keep in touch. I think this is all really fascinating. That's Fasc- like really cool stuff that you're working on. Super. Thanks so much for your for the invitation. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye. Bye you too. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Let me know what you thought of the episode via email, erin at bloomingwellness.com, social media, or perhaps you can leave a YouTube comment since all the podcasts are on YouTube. Oh, and I also put this new thing where if you go to the podcast episode description, there's a link there now where you can message me directly. So pick your poison. Uh, I hope you stick around and subscribe or bookmark or make the podcast a favorite, whatever it is you do to come back here and hear more episodes. There will be subscriber-only episodes coming soon, so just putting that out there as an FYI, I've been writing the scripts for those, and they are going to be, well, they are going to be fun, I think. Anyhow, now it's time for the closing quote. This quote is by Lucille Ball. Ready? Here it is. The secret of staying young is to live honestly, eat slowly, and lie about your age. (laughs) All right, guys. I hope you have a good day wherever you are. I hope you tune in next time, and goodbye for now.